Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to day three of the Aspen Berlin AI Week entitled Humanity Enabled, AI and the Great Economic Acceleration. My name is Olivia Knot. I'm, I'm a program officer at Aspen Germany, and I currently co-lead our digital program. And today I have the pleasure of being your MC for uh, today. Um, the Aspen Berlin AI Conference is actually part of a series we started um, three years ago and enjoys the support of our partners, the state representation of Baden-Württemberg, where our studio is currently set up, um, the Heinz and Heide Dürr -Dür Foundation, um, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, as well as um, Microsoft, Google, Dell, and DNVGL, all of whom I would like to thank on behalf of the Aspen Institute for helping make this, um, making this AI week possible. Um, we are here. We're also live tweeting under the hashtag AspenAI20. If you're participating in the Zoom webinar, you have the possibility of asking questions via the Q&A function, which um, we strongly encourage you to do because we want these discussions to be as interactive um, as possible. Um, we also have simultaneous uh, translations, so you can feel free to switch between uh, German or English. Uh, today, we have another excellent group of speakers lined up for you, starting with Professor Jana Köhler, who will um, be giving a presentation on artificial intelligence and the digital revolution. And I now have the pleasure of introducing her. So Jana Köhler um, is a professor, um, holds the chair of artificial intelligence at the um, University of Saarland and is currently the scientific director of the Algorithmic Business and Production Research Department at um, DFKI. Her research interests focus on AI methods for flexible and optimized processes in manufacturing and, and business. She studied computer science and philosophy at um, the University of Humboldt in Berlin, and she's been in this business for um, a long time and is really one of the leading experts on AI in Germany. So make sure to think of some interesting questions while she gives her presentation, and I'm sure she'll have some um, good insights for us. So, um, Professor Kurla, um, with that, I would like to hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be uh, here. And let me share the presentation, and then we can get started. Okay. Um, Sorry, we are at the front date for speech. So, okay, yeah, um, artificial intelligence and the digital revolution. And uh, let me go back a little bit in history. In 1950, Alan Turing um, asked a very important question. He was wondering whether machines can think. With his pioneering work in uh, computer science and the theoretical models he developed, he noticed that there is um, not much of a boundary in what can be computed. There are boundaries, but they're very, very far out and much further away than what the computers at this time could actually do. So he was wondering how far can we push the boundary and is it in fact uh, possible with uh, the um, huge amount of computing machinery that we will have in the future to create machines that can think. And this question, of course, resonated with many researchers, and therefore these researchers then also started a field that we know as artificial intelligence today. Only a few years later in the United States, a program was set up, uh, which also uh, gave name to this field. And over the decades of uh, intense research, we've seen many successes. And here I created a slide for you that gives you an overview over progress that was made with AI um, algorithms in the field of game playing. In the very early days, uh, Simple games such as checkers, for example, or tic-tac-toe could be tackled. And you see um, the numbers above the, the black uh, timeline. These show the number of games that can be played in a particular game. Already in the 90s, we could tackle games which have a very large search base, such as backgammon, for example. And the system is in very interesting because it actually um, introduced many techniques that we even use today. And to give you an idea about the search space size, uh, the number of at atoms in the universe is estimated as 10 to the power of 80. Now you take each atom and you put half a universe into it, and then you have the number Professor of- Professor Kurla, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can you hear me? Oh. Um, we can't actually yeah. see your presentation. Um, ah. Were you able to share your screen? 
Yeah, let me. Oh, it, it was. It stopped. I'm sorry. No problem. Perfect. Now we see it. Is it now coming? Okay. Yes, yeah, yes you're good really to go. Thank you so you much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for telling me. Um, so here you see this, this overview slide that, that shows this progress in, um, in game playing. And uh, the first publicly noticed um, breakthrough happened in the 90s when uh, Deep Blue uh, won um, chess games against uh, the world um, chess champion. Then we, we've seen um, not a break in research, but we've seen, let's say, um, a break in large successes. So people develop very important fundamental techniques and that then in 2012 triggered uh, this increased interest in AI again. In 2012, IBM demonstrated with Watson what tremendous uh, progress AI systems have made in understanding natural language. Very soon after, Google demonstrated that um, AI two uh, programs can also play such complex games as Go, for example. And the big difference between Go and chess is that we can evaluate the chess position very easily with rules and um, estimate uh, which of the sides has a certain favor. Uh, but with Go, we, uh, this is much, much harder. And here, um, the um, circumstances of the uh, of the digital uh, revolution also made it possible that for example people in the go community played against each other via the internet and this led to large collections of go games and these could be used to train uh, a neural network to actually learn how to assess a position on a go board and then um, this uh, approach was even pushed further by letting uh, these Go programs play against each other without any prior no knowledge and actually then learn how to uh, play Go very well. Um, now, the, the next thing to tackle is uh, so-called imperfect information games that happened over the last two years. So here we saw, for example, also breakthrough in poker where uh, you don't have complete information. So you don't know the cards uh, of your opponents, whereas, for example, in chess and Go, you have complete information about the game. Um, this is all very impressive. And of course, the question is, can we apply this to the real world? And um, yes, we actually can. Any AI system is about perception, cognition, action. So the system is uh, receiving information from, the, uh, from its environment, the real world or a game situation. It uses this information to reason about what it has seen, to come to a decision, and then it executes an action. And um, I just put in, uh, down here a few links. Uh, many people also ask me about some easy accessible material to learn a little bit more about AI without taking an intensive course. So here are a few links uh, to resources that could maybe useful for some of you. So in any app AI application system, we will then need to actually implement these three uh, layers. So we need to be able to connect to the real world, do some reasoning with the information we obtain, and then execute an action. And why is this so important uh, for the digital transformation that is currently taking place? Uh, nearly 10 years ago, uh, a discussion ab around big data came up. So people noticed that by digitalizing our processes, we could generate a lot of data. And this data is very interesting. We can look at it, we can combine it and use it to actually uh, uh, come at um, or arrive at new insights. And uh, this perception, cognition, action uh, cycle looks now in based on these data in a very similar way. So we have to take the data, do a forecast to make a prediction, which where we can actually use machine learning techniques, for example. Then based on this prediction, we conclude that we want to make a certain decision, and then we actually start executing an action. And uh, why is uh, AI here so important to actually implement uh, big data reasoning or big data analysis? Because it's um, the second uh, part of the definition that we see here. Uh, AI is providing us exactly with these cost-effective and innovative forms of information processing. And these um, AI algorithms help us to arrive at these enhanced insights and to improve our decision making. And I want to show you uh, various examples. So one application that we all use and like, and where most people don't even know that it is an AI system, is uh, uh, route planning. So I think everybody is using this 
as soon as we are in, in, in unknown environments, we love to use, for example, Google Maps either for driving or to explore a, a new city. The technology that we can use here to search um, a shortest uh, trip is uh, actually dating back to the 60s and 70s, and it's called heuristic search. But over um, the years, the space technology could even be enhanced with a lot of other digital innovations that happen. For example, today, we can even control it with voice input. And here we added now the new tech AI technology that helps us to process uh, natural language. By implementing uh, additional infrastructures, we can actually take such an AI application with us. So for example, it's very practical to have it in a mobile phone. Decades ago, we could plan uh, a trip on a PC and then print it, but now we can actually have it uh, available all the time whenever we uh, move around. And uh, this application becomes even more useful when we augment, augment it with real-time information. So when we connect it to GPS signals, we can dynamically replan our trip or we can at any pot, uh, point in time know where we are and also get information about traffic jams. So here you see a very typical um, setup for a successful AI application. We have a well-established, well-understood technology. We can add even more AI techniques to make it more useful or easier to use. So many AI applications, in fact, integrate various uh, types of AI algorithms, and we need a certain infrastructure to build up to use such a system. And over the last um, years, we've seen many, many AI applications. So for example, product recommendations in online shops come from AI recommender systems. When we start to dictate, for example, in Office 365, we use speech to text uh, speech recognition systems. Any interaction with a digital assistant such as Siri or Alexa is uh, powered by AI algorithms. Content filtering and social media is AI based information retrieval and search engines, automatic translation, or the great pictures that we take with our cameras usually go through some image processing uh, software. And never, um, last but not least, there's artificial creativity. So here you see a headline from Switzerland. So AI can even be used to brew uh, a cool and well-tasting beer. Uh, today, many people actually wonder what is hype and what is real. So we've seen, uh, on the last slide, many uh, applications that are put in place and where people don't even know that they are powered by AI algorithms. On the other hand, um, other stories, for example, make the press and then uh, there's a lot of debate, how real is this? So one thing do you that you have uh, very likely seen in the last uh, maybe year or two years ago is the discussion about uh, package, package delivery by drones. This is, in my mind, uh, at the moment, currently rather on the, on the hype side. So last mile autonomous delivery for everybody might be technically feasible in the near future. The question is, is, is it also uh, useful to do this? Uh, to, from the current state of the technology, uh, we are currently a little away because we need, in fact, then fail-safe fail systems with humans in the loop. And these must operate flawlessly in the wild, because when we really have them near our houses and intermixing with, uh, for example, our own activities, then they must be rather safe. This means they need to understand the world, they need to make uh, complex decisions in real time, and in fact, perform on par with humans or even exceed them. This needs a little bit more sophisticated um, developments in all kinds of fields, in particular, also the sensing and processing units that we have, and also the battery charging uh, systems. But nevertheless, if the good is uh, very precious, pre uh, uh, let's say, uh, valuable, then of course, there might be good solutions coming up in the future, as I show here at the bottom. But the reality today is, um, that we actually start using drones everywhere, not in a fully autonomous way, but as AI-based co-workers. So one uh, particular uh, successful field of application is drone-assisted photography and sur survey of um, all kinds of construction sites, 
Um, we can use it in agriculture, we can use it for environmental investigation, facility management, and it's of interest, for example, for insurance companies and so on. So why is this uh, a, a scenario which is now put into practice? It's again following the big data paradigm and the use of AI technology to get more data cheaper, faster and better, and to get um, to arrive at uh, more precise decisions and more controlled actions. And in this sense, I want to encourage everybody to uh, not get uh, distracted or confused by maybe some hype scenarios that goes through the press, but rather look into the real world uh, side of these uh, stories and what we can do uh, with them today. Let me say a word about deep learning because um, it is so much uh, discussed. When we use deep learning, we train um, a neural network uh, on a set of data. For example, we might take uh, cases of measles and non measles from pa uh, patient records and we extract a statistical pattern about um, the occurrence of uh, measles, for example, and link this to certain uh, symptoms that might be relevant for uh, this disease. Now we take then another uh, set of data and test this, and this, uh, this uh, statistical pattern that is uh, represented by this neural network, and the test allows us to assess the prediction quality based on the test set. Now what we do in many applications is we now apply the statistical pattern to a single concrete case. And he, we now try to predict the membership of this case in the trained class with a certain confidence. For example, the network could say that Lily has measles with 99% confidence. Here is um, a slight problem that is not yet uh, resolved by AI research. So we do some statistical reasoning about a large set of cases. So what we actually uh, compute is a statistical correlation of all kinds of features that are used to describe a case. These do not necessarily um, represent a causal model. And when we now apply this uh, statistical correlation to a single case, it can be that a neural network actually predicts uh, a certain diagnosis and is very confident about it, but in fact, this, uh, this uh, prediction is, is wrong. So let me say a little bit uh, about the potential errors that can occur in deep learning. We speak of so-called false positives and false negatives. So let's assume Lily has measles. If the network now says that Lily does not have measles, then uh, Lily is a false negative. So the virus of infection is not recognized, there would be no treatment. If Lily has scarlet fever, but the network says that Lily has measles, then this is a false positive. So here the bacterial infection is not uh, recognized and we unfortunately now do a wrong treatment. So false positives very often have very um, harmful um, consequences for those who are affected to these uh, false positive uh, classifications. And in any application, we have to carefully think about um, these potential uh, errors that can occur and we cannot get uh, away of them and need to think about the potential risk and how we can actually hedge the risk. But nevertheless, it uh, should not uh, stop us from looking into this application and use it to enable all these kind, nice uh, innovations that are possible using the technology. Because in many cases, we can uh, do something to catch these errors or actually make sure that uh, they don't have too harmful consequences. Let me also say a few words about uh, search algorithms. So we've seen in, in the slide that gave the overview on the development of game uh, playing AI systems that neural networks can be nicely used, for example, to assess a situation in a game. This is the information that now the AI system can use to the, find out which move to make next. Very often AI systems now use um, stochastic search to explore many different uh, variants of moves that could be made. So what the, um, for example, here in this uh, chess scenario, we want to know how can the queen beat the king? So the AI system will now do an exploration. It will 
just play a game with some arbitrary moves and see how good this came out. When it does this a million of times, it finds some uh, stochastic uh, sequences of moves that are actually good. And then it will exploit this information about good moves and look uh, in nearby uh, moves if they can uh, further improve its uh, decisions. This enables AI search algorithms to find very successful and very often surprising moves to you, uh, humans. And even if we uh, give them um, um, sufficient resources, they can even find optimal moves. But of course, in many practical applications, we are bound. So it might not be the optimal move, but it will very often be a very good one. Uh, what we do here is some is uh, we do something that is uh, called stochastic sampling. So assume you have a big uh, paper um, board and you go outside in your garden and place this little this big board on the ground and now you draw a circle and now you observe how the raindrops uh, drop on the surface. And this will happen in some stochastic process. And when you then count uh, the drops that you have inside the circle and uh, outside the circle, but in the rectangle, you can actually calculate the number of pi. And the more observations you do, the better your calculation will be. And this is the same um, method that um, AI systems uh, apply to over time improve also their solution when they search for optimal actions. These uh, types of computation uh, will enable many game-changing innovations. So I listed a few uh, in the beginning, but I also want to point out to you some complex industrial problems that we definitely need to tackle now in the near future. A good example is fast fashion. Fast fashion is um, produced in low, um, um, low cost countries. We are, it often comes with very low social standards. The working conditions for the people who produce uh, the fashion items are not the best ones. The main focus is on cheap labor. We have long transportation times. And that's why we also have this very high waste rate because we produce uh, fashion in advance, but the fashion cycle has accelerated a lot. And this means that over 50% of the clothes that is produced is actually never worn. And this in, causes in the end a very bad ecological footprint. So with AI methods, we can actually do better. So we can, for example, with robots, increase the degree of uh, automation and thereby bring uh, manufacturing back uh, to Europe. This leads to much shorter delivery cycles and it moves us much closer to on-demand planning and scheduling of production. So we can online or in time decide where we uh, manufacture a specific uh, item. We can distribute this across, flexibly across different manufacturing sites with a high degree of automation. The labor costs are still low, but on the other hand, we actually create a lot of qualified jobs, for example, in overseeing or maintaining robotized uh, factories. We can also use then AI algorithms to not only uh, automatically or intelligently uh, plan the production in time, we can also integrate this with logistics and the advancement in, in scalability of um, algorithms to these huge problem uh, spaces allows us to do this. And with this, we achieve a just-in-time adaptation and change, which also improves the resilience and flexibility uh, in the industry. Of course, for uh, the fashion industry, this is a long way to go, and in particular to um, replace the high, uh, let's say, high um, tactile skills of female workers when they sew the, the garments is a real challenge. But we see the trends like this in many other industries. For example, down here at the slide, I put a link to an, some news about the Renault Group that actually transform a car. Uh, um, a factory from car manufacturing to car recycling and thereby creates even more jobs. So with this, I want to actually um, come to an end in my talk. Any AI uh, application project needs to satisfy three um, 
essential or needs to address three essential perspectives to be uh, successful. And managing AI projects is a real challenge for many companies. That's why I team together with the University of St. Gallen and we are working on a management um, method that makes it in particular uh, easier for small and medium companies to adopt uh, the technology in their um, innovation efforts. So when you, we have uh, three main stakeholders in, a, in any project, but also in particular in an AI project. We have the managers, the engineers, and the users. The managers uh, can easily answer what is viable. So what will be economically successful, what can be successfully implemented in a company, in a market, and so on. Engineers can tell us what is feasible. What can we do with uh, modern technology and how can it be done? And users can tell us what is desirable. If we bring these uh, stakeholder groups together and also ask engineers what is viable, so how sustainable is, for example, the technology each stake, or also ask users what is feasible, so can they actually manage to use the technology and is it uh, possible for them to improve uh, the, the way how they reach their goals, then we get um, a very good perspective on a project that helps us to be successful with the development. And uh, with this, I want to end my talk and I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward uh, to your questions. Professor uh, Kula, thank you so much for that um, excellent presentation and review also of the history of AI and how far we've come. And it's really a reminder that um, you know, the, the recent breakthroughs are not that long ago, and we're really just at the beginning of um, unleashing AI's um, potential. I thought it was very interesting um, that the major breakthroughs that you talked about um, were in the world of gaming, you know, um, with DeepMind um, first having focused on um, board games and now focusing also on, on video games. And um, it seems like gaming is a very sort of fruitful place to test AI, given that it's a, a controlled environment. You have the ability to collect a lot of data via um, randomized play and self-play. And you already said that um, these applications are being used and are transferable to the real world. So I'm curious to hear more about um, your research as a director of the Algorithmic Business and Production Department and sort of the applications that you are currently working on or models that are being used um, in an industrial um, context, for example. Yeah, for example, uh, we work on uh, solutions for uh, scheduling problems in the industry, for example, so-called uh, flow shop problems where products have to go through a predefined set of manufacturing operations and we need to keep the flow of resources and products uh, very well synchronized and we also want to um, adapt um, the flow to changing situations and this is something where we can actually use these uh, stochastic search algorithms that were developed in the game space so this scales very very nicely to these applications and we work in particular on methods also to simplify the description and um, the modeling of the environments and also make it easier to, uh, to specify the optimization criteria and objectives that a solution should uh, meet. And apart from this, for example, I also work on um, uh, medical application scenarios where in fact uh, optimization problems also occur. So we are currently discussing um, with a team in, um, of epigenetics researchers here in, in Saarbrücken about uh, how we can with our methods help them to better analyze their data and understand what is going on in, in cells for example and how certain cell transformations relate to certain diseases and interestingly even there optimization problems occur and we can model them very nicely but we need to further advance the algorithm to scale to even larger search spaces. So these applications are even more complex than what we've seen in, in the game uh, scenarios. 
Um, on the, the keyword algorithms, um, when we talk about algorithms, you often hear about you know, problems of bias. You hear um, examples of predictive policing, um, assessing risks of recidivism, hiring um, employees. Um, and due to many of these ethical concerns, there, there have been um, recommendations and calls by um, the government, including Germany's Data Ethics Commission, to um, carefully regulate these algorithms and also make sure that um, they're, they're always human-centric. Um, so I'm wondering, um, when it comes to the use of AI algorithms um, to analyze data or to control uh, manufacturing systems, where do you see the biggest um, risks and um, perhaps need for regulation in that context? Well, um, overall, of course, we... Um Let's say we have less problems when we use, for example, the optimization and search algorithms that I apply because we have guarantees and our models are explainable in contrast to, for example, neural network models. So this makes it easier. We can, for example, meet certain explanation requirements. And I think this is also important to uh, establish regulations that models have to, depending on the type of application and the potential risk that models have or um, that are used by AI, algor AI algorithms to reason and to take decisions need to be transparent. So the higher the risk, the more transparency we need. And um, a particular risk that we might face in, in, um, in production scenarios is of course coming from information that is not fully perfect from sensors and from, uh, for example, um, let's say, yeah, I think sen sensing systems, for example, make a, make a, uh, might, be, might exhibit certain failures. And there we need to add, for example, checks to these um, event data that we, for example, monitor the data and also uh, add uh, plausibility checks. Could this really be true? So in whatever then solution is proposed based on the data, we need additional checks that we uh, make sure that we don't actually exceed uh, certain thresholds, for example. Absolutely. And, and of course, what we also see is very interesting when we optimize the production and we are in a scenario where uh, humans still play a big role, then we need to um, add additional uh, constraints and boundary conditions that ensure that the workflow is uh, also addressing human needs. So, for example, we can see in our uh, investigations that the optimal solutions that the AI uh, produces uh, will not be one that, um, let's, let's say, it might not be very pleasant for humans unless we actually require certain conditions that have to meet, have to be met. Thank you so much for that. I actually have a few uh, questions that are coming in from the audience that I would like to address. Um, uh, the first one being, um, I'll just read it out loud uh, for you. The basis of AI is prediction. However, what behavioral science has shown us is that predictions are always wrong. If AI is learning from past data of at least biased decisions, how can it effectively make predictions for good decisions? And um, is it not the only way for AI to make accurate predictions to actually create self-fulfilling prophecies if enough people or systems follow through with the recommendations, thus effectively creating the environment predicted by the AI. So coming back to this issue of um, problems and, and making predictions yeah. that you addressed in your presentation. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, I, I fully agree. When we uh, use these statistical correlations that we uh, generate from historic data, we just enforce uh, historically uh, valid patterns. And uh, we have to be very careful that we don't actually use this to uh, for example, increase even negative patterns or biased patterns in the future. And some explications have definitely shown this. And uh, the difference, for example, in my work is, is that I use co uh, causal models. So they are not based on statistical correlations. And these causal models have been reviewed with engineers. And they also give insights uh, for companies to, for example, improve a certain machine or develop a production process with novel features. For example, in one application, we've seen that given the type of products, the way how the assembly line was set up uh, was not uh, very effective. So it always led to a, um, 
um, blocking of certain products at certain stations, and when we could easily tell how to improve the uh, assembly line. But I definitely agree. We have, I mean, we have to really be a little careful how much we can learn from historic data. I personally believe that, nevertheless, using these correlations and then use it for creativity and to generate completely new solutions is also a very interesting approach. So um, the let's say the critical side does not really come from the technology itself, but rather from how it's used uh, in certain applications. That's a really good point. Um, and I, I actually want to ask um, another question here um, related to AI applications. Um, so the question is, how big uh, an effort is needed to develop an AI application? Could a single person develop an AI app that might be successful at the market, like the garage companies that are now world leaders? <laughs> if, well, I think first of all, it needs a good uh, idea, and this is still coming from human creativity. Um, it's, I think it's possible even for a single person to do something really good because we have so many uh, um, packed um, or packaged and uh, ready to use AI frameworks now. And I can even develop uh, applications using these frameworks by using cloud-based computing resources. So there is, of course, a, uh, quite some effort. And I think a, per a single person that needs to uh, be in, in many, many different roles. But um, given the, the uh, support that we get today from cloud computing, uh, let's say even a small team can uh, use all these external resources and put something very good together. So yes, yeah, so that is uh, basically a call for uh action, even if you're just uh, working at uh, home, out of a garage or wherever, to be encouraged to develop your own app. Um, I wanted to come back um, to the issue of the digital um, footprint that you addressed in your presentation um, as an example in the clothing industry. And a lot of people have talked about how um, AI and uh, mitigating uh, climate change basically go hand in hand, um, which I think um, is really interesting because um, while AI seems to be able to sort of optimize um, processes and make them more energy efficient, the more complex algorithms become, the more computational power they require, which in turn also creates a big uh, carbon footprint. So do you think, um, what's the trade-off there and do you think the, the benefits will outweigh the cost? I think uh, it depends on the on the applications. Today, what we see is we see um, many AI applications rather in the virtual world. For example, recommender systems to sell us more products, or we see um, translation systems and so on. And I think in particular for the German industry, the challenge, but also the uh, huge opportunity is to bring the AI systems to the real world. And there the opportunities and, and um, resource uh, savings outweigh definitely the, the development costs. In particular, if you think that um, training systems uh, is some effort, but then, for example, if you use neural networks to, for example, do some uh, predictive maintenance, but then actually applying these technologies is very, very efficient because they just do a single run of computation and uh, do some number crunching that is uh, done very, very efficiently and then is definitely uh, much um, cheaper than, for example, wasting uh, certain um, times because uh, an entire assembly line is, is interrupted because a single device, for example, failed. Interesting. Um, I wanted to um, briefly talk about one of your research um, projects, which um, focuses on Industry 4.0 and um, digital twins. Um, and uh, digital twins has basically, um, well, it's a digital replica of a living or non-living living physical entity. And it's been described as basically being a prerequisite uh, for um, Industry 4.0 to work um, effectively. Um, so I'm just curious to know, um, is German industry using applications such as these? Um, how far are we in uh, making progress with our goals for Industry 4.0? And um, what barriers do you think are still standing in the way of increased adoption? 
Yeah, I, I've seen uh, quite a number of applications where companies start to create uh, physical, uh, let's say, digital models of their systems. And we also see new tools coming up that uh, make this easier. And uh, many processes can be uh, very well described, in particular if we have um, deterministic um, processes that, that are discrete, or we also understand from uh, physics and mechanical engineering, we have already models that we can use to implement in these digital twins. Not all uh, pro manufacturing processes can uh, describe today, for example, at such a level of detail that we can use it, for example, to run perfect simulations. I worked a few years ago on such an application where the machine had such a stochastic and dynamic behavior, that it was very hard to predict uh, how the how it will, or let's say how the product that what was assembled will behave. But nevertheless, even in this case, at a certain level of abstraction, we could uh, come up with a sufficient criteria to uh, produce robust uh, solutions to control the machine. And uh, it, um, the challenge is that we first uh, find out what we want to do and also uh, adopt an incremental approach. So it's not worth... Um, at the moment to create, for example, a complete digital uh, twin of something and we don't know what, what we want to do with it. We first need to have an idea where we want to have some um, resource um, savings or where we want to be more flexible or maybe uh, make certain steps uh, faster and then uh, develop the digital model that is exactly needed for this application. And then based on this experience and the insights and the learning that a company does through such a project, it can then and also develop a um, let's say digitalization strategy and industry for zero roadmap for its own uh, production and products. So it's definitely an iterative process and uh, you know perhaps we're still um, a while away before having um, digital twins of entire um, value added chains or um, AI ecosystems. Um, we only have a few more minutes uh, and a couple more questions I wanted to get to. Um, one question um, I have here is is there an AI equivalent uh, to the human genome program <laughs> that you know of? <laughs> um, I, yes, <laughs> I think I, I, I think the, the community that works on artificial general intelligence, this is maybe comparable. Mm. However, if we uh, recall what has happened to the human genome program was that we, of course, deciphered the genome, but we also realized it doesn't help us. To, we still don't understand how cancer happens. We've learned a lot and we made progress, but we have to continue. And uh, similar in, in AI, we have people, for example, such as me, who rather focus on specific application domains and then drive uh, certain classes of algorithms to solve these application problems. But we have also um, a big community that wants to understand intelligence in general and develop computer-based uh, systems that possess this general intelligence and then uh, might even, uh, let's say, exceed us in our capabilities. And this could be, in my eyes, co considered as uh, similar in, in the ambition, but we can also learn from the Human Genome Program that is a long way to go. And I think there's been um, lots of breakthroughs now as well um, with COVID-19 serving uh, as an impetus of uh, doing more AI research in, in that field as well. Um, I think I have time for just one uh, last question, um, which is what is the next field to which AI will be introduced on a major scale? Well, <laughs> um, for me, it's the industry. I'm, I'm really confident we will see it in logistics and industrial production. This will be, but of course, uh, medical applications are also important. And here it's less to replace doctors, but for example, to provide us with new diagnostic tools and uh, new ways how we can actually look at medical data. 
I think that's um, an excellent point to end on. We are just about out of time here. Uh, thank you so much, um, Professor Kula, for your excellent you. insights, the fascinating um, presentation, and um, this discussion. It was great having you. Um, we are now going to um, have a short five-minute break, um, after which um, we will have a panel discussion on big players, startups, and the innovation paradox. So make sure to tune back in in about five minutes. Thanks so much. <laughs>